Sadashivasamarambham Shankaracharya Matyamam Asmadacharya Paryantam Vande Guru Paramparam Welcome to chapter 13. And this is a, a rather uh, important transition into the third section of the Bhagavad Gita. So before we uh, give us a context of chapter 13, obviously we will have to first have the context of the entire Gita so that we can smoothly transition into the third section. The Bhagavad Gita is divided into three sections. The first section is between chapter 1 and 6. The second section is chapter 7 to 12. The third section is chapter 13 to 18. So let's cover 1 to 6 first. In chapter 1, how does chapter 1 start? Arjuna, who is a jiva, an individual, is confronted with a life crisis. Isn't this how we always start? At some point or another, we come to a certain point in life and there's an obstacle, there's a crisis. And we're like, hmm, there's no way out of here. Whichever way I think about it, I'm still stuck. So Arjuna is stuck. And this is something that we all relate to. This is why the Bhagavad Gita is not a text at 5,000 years ago or whenever it happened. It is a evergreen text that applies at all ages, at all times, in all backgrounds, in all cultures. And Arjuna sees either way is a loss. If I win this war, I'm still lost because the families of those soldiers will be killed. The widows will now be without a husband and the children will have no father to look up to. So this means either way, whether I win or whether I lose this war, I cannot see that I've actually won. So Arjuna first understood that this is a zero sum game. Whether I think I won, I've actually lost. Even though I think I won, if I look at all of the variables, actually I've still hurt someone. And then Arjuna now has a choice. So after the confrontation of the life crisis, you're confronted with a choice. Choice A, put things under the carpet. In Arjuna's case, go to Rishikesh. In other words, deny what's in front of me. This is something that we all are tempted to do sometimes. However, it never works because where is that going to go? In what existence are you going to put it under? It's going to come into the same existence as the one that you find yourself in. So in other words, it's going to come at some point or another in life when the right environment triggers it. So that's option one. Put things under the carpet. Deny it. Pretend like it is not here. It's an easy way. In fact, even some cultures or some families will teach their children um, you know, not, not really how to, you know, confront or share your emotions. So the quickest way is just to kind of walk into your room, close the door and not even address anything. Just let time fade the confrontation away. So that by the time the door opens, everything's as though normal. But later on in life, all of this resentment, all of these unaddressed issues start to come out. They start to surface out and that causes psychological trauma, psychological uh, resentment and anger and all sorts of emotional complications. That is the price for putting things under the carpet when in fact, what is option B? Option B is, in Arjuna's case, face it head on when it's fresh, right now, right here. First one, easy. Second one, hard. First one, immediate gratification, but lots of problems in the future. Second one, very hard, not so easy, but your life, little by little, starts to become very firm, very strong. It resolves itself. Why? Because you're resolving life itself when it's confronting you. So this is what Arjun has chosen. So now, chosen option B, what's the next step? Do you just go, oh, okay, I've chosen to address this. And then you don't do anything. If you don't do anything, that is what, option A, right? So in other words, Arjuna now confronts the teacher. In other words, he seeks for guidance. He says, from top of the mountain, I cannot figure this out because if I could have, I would have done it a long time ago. That's why we need a teacher. Because think about it. If I could have figured my life out, wouldn't you would have done it a long time ago? Of course, because who wants to suffer one more day? <laughs> In other words, 
Arjuna is very honest about him. And this is his strength. Whereas Duryodhana is like, you know, putting, it's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Duryodhana is putting a very strong image of himself, you know, by big hero. And I don't need any, any help, you know, let's just, uh, let's, you know, uh, you know, like non-emotional. And look at Arjuna emotional he he literally uh, he starts to cry like he, you know he shows his weakness right in front of the battlefield and who won the war Duryodhana the, the tough guy or Arjuna the Mr. Emotional guy the emotional guy in other words honesty always wins over fakeness over superficiality however superficiality is much easier honesty is much harder what happens then Krishna walks into his life in other words only when you acknowledge that you need help only then you open the door to, to the help. Until then, you can have the best teaching, the best teacher. They simply cannot get into your heart, into your mind, because the person is just not at that stage of accepting the knowledge yet. Even if you show someone the difference between Dwaitam and Advaitam, and even if you point out the fallacies in Dwaitam, in fact, I just had an, a lady as a teacher, obviously you will get constant confrontations from other competing schools, and this is quite normal. And even you will be surprised, even if you show every analogy possible that makes perfect sense, it will still be interpreted in the light of Dwightum. And they will say, oh, we see even the ocean, even the wave, even the H2O, even that example proves that everything is just two here. So this means the mind's still simply not ready. So this means what can you do with this person? You just need to wait it out. You need to let life experience show them enough experience so they can start to open up their heart and then finally say, I need help. I can't figure this out. So this is why Arjuna has had the best teacher walk into his life, the Lord himself. Next, what happens is Arjuna needs to now resolve this, right? Now, how does this happen? It happens between chapter two and chapter six. This is the teaching of the teacher of Krishna. Chapter two to chapter six. So we now cover chapter one, right? This is the stories of Arjuna's despair. Now chapter two to six is divided into three topics. So I'm going to t cover now topic number one. Topic number one starts in chapter two. Obviously that's the next chapter. What is chapter two about? or it resolves the apparent difference between the individual, that is the jiva, and the total cause, that is Ishwara. The individual purusha, purusha means person. So it resolves that apparent difference. Like how am I, the small, limited, finite purusha, finite individual, time-bound, mortal, how am I the same, or how is my essence the same as the total purusha, who is beginningless, who is eternal, who is limitless, who is infinite, where's the connection there? So this is what chapter two shows right up front. So what is it? So what's the first teaching? Krishna first addresses the big picture and then he goes top down. So this means Arjuna is now going to have a big picture and then he's going to say, I don't understand. What's Krishna going to do? He's going to now show him how to understand the big vision. So in other words, we start top and then we go down. Chapter four and five shows that the doer and the experiencer, that mechanism belongs to the body mind. So now let's ask, what is the doer? What is this concept that does? For example, uh, you know, you pick up your pen right now, right? That's, that's doing, or even if you're uh, writing something, that's, that's an act of doing. So let's ask, what is this door and experiencer mechanism? When you say door, it is referring to the body mind responding to stimuli. Suppose now there's a loud bang in your kitchen, right? The stove explodes. Are you going to, res is your body mind going to respond to that? Of course. Is it just going to sit here and go, no, you know, everything's fine here. Everything's one. We don't need to go do anything now. So it's going to naturally respond to the stimuli of the environment. And this is what the body mind does all day long. Someone says something to you, you are, the body mind is, has to respond, right? The body mind feels hungry. It does the food. It does the eating. In other words, it's responding to stimuli all day long. And how does it do this? It does this by the help of various orders, like psychological order. You need to be mentally stable in order to make sense of what it means to be hungry, what it means to, uh, to, to seek some help. You need to have physiological order working. 
In other words, you need to have the, the organs, you know, put in the right place and all functioning together. The gravitational order, if there was no gravity, you'd be floating up. You couldn't do anything. There is a chemical order. There is a biological order. So all of these orders, through their help, the body mind is capable of doing. Doing what? Responding to the environment. For example, if I take out the psychological order, you couldn't do anything. It would be like a brain dead person, right? So by, these help, by the help of these orders, the body mind's capable of doing. Doing what? Responding to the environment. For example, suppose a, imagine, a car is heading towards the trajectory of your body. What's the body going to do? It's going to calculate, assess, according to the trajectory where this object is going, if it continues going to that same way, it's going to make contact with this object called the body. So, in or, so then what activates? Activates the amygdala, right? The amygdala, the system, that's one of the physiological orders, that is to fight or flight. In other words, to protect the system, what does the body do? It moves out of the way in order to not be, in order to continue its survival. Now, does it stop there? Do you just, do you just kind of like, you know, continue walking as though nothing, nothing happened? Absolutely not. What happens then? There's an emotional alleviation, an emotional relief. Whew, that was close. I feel so good to be alive. In other words, what follows right after something is done? An experience. That's why we say door enjoyer, door sufferer. Wherever there is an experiencer, what precedes the experience? The doing. So in other words, what is the door enjoyer? The body mind responding to stimuli. When it responds, what comes next? The experience. This is just a natural experience that we all have. To whom does this door enjoyer experience belong? The answer is to the body mind. So let's do a little metaphor. Whatever happens to the hardware and the software happens to what? Happens to the hardware and software. Does it touch the electricity? No. However, if you think about it, both hardware and software and electricity are the same orders of reality. Are they not? They're just subatomic particles. So isn't that strange? Even though there are two different orders of reality, electricity, hardware, and software, right? Hardware and software is one category. Electricity is another category. So no, no matter what happens to one order of reality that's called hardware and software, it doesn't touch another order of reality called electricity. And yet both orders of reality are just what? Subatomic particles. They're both just one reality. So why am I using this metaphor? If you think about your body and your mind, your body and your mind, whatever doing, whatever experiencing happens, it doesn't touch consciousness. And yet the body, mind, and the consciousness are just what? The one same consciousness reality. And this reality in Sanskrit we call Brahman. Two orders of reality, body, mind, consciousness. Body, mind, doing, enjoying, doesn't touch, doesn't affect the consciousness. And yet they're both of the one same reality called consciousness. Now let's bring this door enjoyer to a less philosophical level. Why are you not the door? Well, because you're, you're the awareness of the doer, of the enjoyment of the doer. What if we don't know about awareness and consciousness now? Because this is a less philosophical level now. Think about it this way. If you were the doer, does that not imply you would have total control over everything? Because you're doing it, right? You're doing every step of the way. Does that not imply you would have total control over your dreams and your sleep? Does that not imply you would be able to like press the button whenever you want and press dream and then you start to dream, right? And you go, hmm, okay. Since I'm the door, I can now press the button to sleep and then go into deep sleep. And then the door, since the door is still there, right? The door goes, hmm, okay, enough of sleeping. I'm kind of bored of sleeping. Let me go back into dream state. Okay, now you go into dream state. Does that, is, that what, is that what you do? No. That is done for you. They come in their own time. So I want to bring down the point of where free, because this is actually a good example, where the limits of your free will ends. Think about it this way. Suppose you want to go to sleep right now. What is the only thing from the aspect of your free will that you can do to go to sleep? Close your eyes. You can close your eyes. You can also make the bed warm and you, you can also make the bed soft, right? If you have a hard bed, it's going to be a lot harder to sleep. But does that guarantee that you will go to sleep? No. However, it does what? It increases the chances 
of the grand order called sleep coming forward and thus transitioning you into sleep. So what is the only thing you, the individual, did? You increase the probabilities of helping this grand order to come forward to perform its to perform its will and thus help you to move forward into a different uh, into a different uh, place so this is a very important point because we, we often kind of mix up where does my free will end your free will ends at the point where you can just increase your chances now in aspect of Vedanta how do you increase your chances for the knowledge taking place for being firm by constant practice, by constant reflection, by you know, listening through, uh, through introspection. But does that guarantee that your life will get transformed? No. But that does increase the probabilities of your life being transformed. So this is where, when we say God's will comes to, comes to place. Just like we say, all I can do is I can make the bed soft. So I've performed my will, but what is then God's will? What is Ishwara's will? Ishwara's will is to help you to sleep in that same way with Vedanta. What is God's will? Moksha. What is the individual's will? Moksha. What does moksha mean? Fullness. What is God? Fullness. What does the individual want? Fullness. In fact, in the Course in Miracles, it beautifully says, his will is your will. And what is his will? Fullness. And what is every single individual seeking? Fullness. So in that same way, what is the only thing that an individual can do? increase the probabilities. So I'm saying this so we don't say, oh, you know, what's the point? Whatever I do, it's not working. Yes, everything is working. Just like if you go to sleep, if you go to your bed, every little thing does increase the chances of this order called his will helping you to transition you into a different place. The second reason is if you were the doer enjoyer, then you would never suffer. So if you were the doer, you would immediately press the button, nope, stop suffering but suffering still comes whether we like it or not. So obviously the individual does not have the power, is not the door, because if you were the door, you'll be able to have total control over your experience, including how you feel. Okay, so these are two reasons why we're not the door enjoyer. So chapter one to six, going back, talks about twam, the, the equation, mahavaka is tatwamasi. Twam means you, so it talks about you, the individual. What is your nature as individual? Now, topic two, that was topic one. Topic two talks about karma yoga sadhana. What is this sadhana for? It helps to introvert the naturally extroverted mind. So when we get born, where is our mind? Is it inwards? Are we just naturally contemplative, introspective? Or is our minds out there? Our minds is naturally by default into the world, looking at objects, looking at toys. So throughout the life, the, the mind remains outwards, but what the objects keep on changing. At the beginning, it's um, toys, and then it's boys, right? And then it's uh, cars, and then it's you know, whatever they're interested in nowadays. So in other words, the mind remains extroverted throughout. And so what does Karma Yoga do? It simply helps the person to take that beginninglessly extroverted mind and to start to finally put it inwards, to start looking inwards instead of outwards. Topic one done, topic two done, topic three is role of individual effort. So this is now you're asking, where does my effort, where does your effort, and what effort do you have? Like what level of effort in this world do you have? So to explain this, the jiva, that means the individual at time of birth is endowed with two factors, with two principles. The first principle that you and I are endowed with are samskaras. Samskaras means method of thinking. You tell me this, is it not true that every single person from the moment they start to grow up, there's a certain way that you think about the world. There's a natural tendency how you think about the world. If you have a brother or sister, right, they will think one way and you will find yourself thinking a totally different way. So these samskaras are just simply called methods of thinking, the way that you naturally think about things. Now, where do these samskaras come from? They come from the previous life. And they set the theme for your present life. And this theme is what's called in Sanskrit, your prarabdha karma. How things are to be. In other words, your destiny or your fate. These are synonymous words, destiny or fate. The second principle that a jiva is endowed with is free will. This is purushartha. Free will 
can now be used for two purposes. Go back to samskaras. It can either be used to reinforce those samskara-based thinking patterns. Suppose they're destructive. So free will can simply be used to reinforce them and to continue those destructive patterns in this life, or it can be used to say, what are alternative ways of looking at this? Can I start to minimize them so that I can spend some time on something else? Unfortunately, most decide to simply use the free will to simply subordinate to the samskaras that are coming from the past, past life. In other words, the life continues, life after life, it just continues the same thinking, same uh, likes and dislikes, same everything. So this means this free will alone is used to what? Intercept these samskaras and say, hey, my habit for you know, extroversion is, 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 is there, but I still have the power by the endowment of free will to intercept it and to spend a little bit more time in, my, in myself, in my own thoughts. For example, if you look at the Vedic horoscope, the Nadi astrology in Tamil Nadu, so what happens is uh, the Brahmanas are very smart, of course. They will look at your, uh, they will look at the stars alignment, they will look at a few more factors, and they will tell you about your individual prarabdha karma. In other words, your uh, your life trajectory, and they will say a few things, right? You know, this is what's going to happen at a certain time, and and you got kind of like, hmm, interesting. You know, this is a tell me more, more, more. Now, the moment you walk out of their door, what's still with you? your second endowment, your free will. So this means, so this is where it gets confusing. Now, suppose you have a lot of trust in the astrologer and you say, wow, okay, so this is, so you're absolutely right. This is going to happen to me. And you walk out with that perception. What's that going to do? It's going to minimize the person's exercise or use of free will. Therefore, it's going to be what? A self-fulfilling prophecy. Because now whenever they come to a situation in life, they're going to say, well, what's the point of applying my free will since what the astrologers told me is going to happen anyway? So this is why some people say, you know, yeah, but how do you explain that these astrologers are 100% correct? Easy. Because the person who listened took the, gave total power to the astrologer and they walked out and they didn't still make use of their free will. Therefore, they just allow these circumstances to play out until it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. The final message of chapter one to six is this, uplift yourself by yourself. That is what Krishna is trying to teach us. Who's going to uplift you? You. Uplift yourself by yourself. Who's going to save you? You. In other words, all of the responsibility and effort is on us, on you. Now, chapter 7 to 12, this is the second section of the Bhagavad Gita. So you will put on a piece of paper, chapter 7 to 12. Again, this is divided into three topics. The first topic is the nature of the cause of the universe. What caused this universe and what is the nature of that cause? In other words, tell me about the cause from which the universe came, by which the universe is sustained by, and into which the universe resolves. Tell me about that cause. I want to know because I'm not apart from that cause. So that means if I understand that cause, I will get to understand myself also. In the scriptures, we give different names to this. We say Ishwara, Bhagavan, Paramatma, Parameshwaraha, God, Lord. These are some of the names that we use. Why don't we just use Ishwara? Because if, you, if we did, it will be very boring. It will be very repetitive. So the Upanishads are creative. Uh, you got Vishnu Sahasranama, you got 1,000 names. And if you look at those names, what are they? Omniscient, omnipresent, supreme, right? all-knowing. These are all different names to describe that one supreme highest reality. That's why we use different names. Chapter 7 to 12 talks about, go back to the Mahavakya, Tatwamasi. We talked about Twam, you, chapter 1 to 6. Now, Tat, that, that, that refers to the cause of the universe. Therefore, chapter 7 to 12 specifically mentions this cause of the universe, that is Tat. So when it says Tat, Twamasi, Tat, that, the universe, Twam, you, and then Asi, are, which we will get to the Asi in the last section. The second topic of chapter 7 to 12 is Upasana Yoga. Upasana Yoga level 1 is mentioned in chapter 6. Specifically, it involved the Ashtanga Yoga, Patanjali Yoga, eight steps. What is Upasana Yoga level 1? 
Ishtadeva. What is Ishtadeva? Meditating upon my customized or personalized version of divinity. Then level two of Upasana Yoga was mentioned in chapter 11. What is level two about? Coming to the recognition that this entire material universe, this entire universe of names and forms is put together by the one intelligence. So this means wherever I see material, wherever I see any name, any form, it is being held together by this one intelligence. If you look at your hand right now, Hmm, hand. What's holding that hand together right now? This very intelligence. What is your hand? It's material, is it not? So whatever I see material, I'm also seeing that total intelligence when right now. So this means you're as though swimming in Ishwara, swimming in God all the time. So again, what is Upasana Yoga level two? Coming to see that every object in this universe is made out of the same material and the same intelligence. And that intelligence is holding that material into the form that we call it so. Topic number three, between chapter number seven and 12, is Ishwara Anugrahaha or Ishwara Kripa. This means the grace of Ishwara. So now you have to ask, what role does the grace of God have in your life? I said the ex previous example, there's only so much you can do to go to sleep. But then the rest takes over by itself. You have no power to press the dream button or to press the sleep button. It happens of its own accord. All you can do is increase the chances for that to happen. In that same way, what is Ishwara Anugraha? It means acknowledging, number one, that my free will has limitations, no doubt. And number two, there are unknown variables that you simply do not know, that you and I cannot know. Is that your experience? Your free will is limited. Even if you want to change, you still find it hard to do so, right? We all have a picture of how we want to be, but relatively speaking, but we still find it hard to actually represent that, that, that idol, that image. And number two, there are unknown variables. Even if you want to, for example, get a job, for example. How many unknown variables are there that's standing in, in between you and getting the job? A lot. There are other people who want the job too. Um, you know, suddenly you can have another lockdown coming in and it has to postpone the job and then you lose the opportunity. There are many unknown variables. So this means you have to accept that your free will has a certain limit. So therefore, we convert this helplessness into Ishwara Anugraha, into prayer into puja into sincerity of looking for seeking for help how through prayer so what is ishwara nugraha converting your helplessness into prayer the question is why would you want to do that because prayer is another cause that you're putting out into the field and there is no cause that goes without an effect that is just a law Cause and effect are interrelated. Therefore, every time you send out a prayer, believe it or not, you're actually increasing the chances of getting what you are sincerely seeking for, whether you know about it or not. Chapter 13 to 18. Again, this is divided into three topics. The first topic reveals the non difference between the individual that is the jiva and the total cause of the universe between you and the cause of the universe, which is called Ishwara. That means reveals the non-difference between the jiva and the Ishwara. For example, there is an apparent difference between your tongue and your toe, is there not? The name's different, like tongue is tongue, toe is toe. Tongue has a job of tasting and you know, doing talking, and toe has a job of maneuvering your body. So there's an apparent difference. But if you think about it, they're both born of and sustained by, by the one or the same conscious entity. And that same conscious entity, in the presence of its intelligence, the tongue does what it does, and so does the toe do what the toe does. By, the who, by whom? By the same one intelligence belonging to whom? The one entity 
because of whom the tongue has its existence and because of which the toe also has its existence. So now imagine now the tongue says, looks at the toe and goes, uh, you know, toe, you're down there and I'm up here. I'm so much more superior. You know, you're like spiritually inferior or you're that color of this and the kind of, you know, the, the pride, the spiritual pride. Why is, it, why is the tongue saying that? Because the tongue is enjoying its existence in the one entity, the same entity in whom the toe is also enjoying its existence. In other words, the tongue is saying that because of this intelligence, that same intelligence is guiding the toe to do what it does. In fact, if you think about it, if the toe, suppose the toe doesn't go to the shop, right? Because, you know, it feels offended that the tongue was, uh, you know, calling it off. Then what's going to happen? The tongue's going to die because the tongue needs to, because the shop, you need to buy groceries to eat food in order to nurture, nurture this body. And the tongue needs food. So in other words, whatever, wherever you look, there is an interconnectedness, whether you know about it or not. And that one interconnectedness resolves in this one total conscious, intelligent entity, which we call Ishwara or Bhagavan or God or Lord. So this changes our perspective as to how we look at this world. Now let's extend this little example a little bit more. This conscious sentient entity is made sentient, why? Because of the prana traveling through the body. For now, I'll talk about prana later, but for now, prana is the life force that's making this conscious, intelligent uh, entity function and does what it does. So this means because of that prana, the intelligent being is capable of functioning the tongue and also functioning the toe. Because of what? The prana. In that same way, the same consciousness is required for Ishwara, the total being of the universe, to run this universe, but also for the individual, you and I, to run our small lives. By what? The same consciousness principle. Because what is there of intelligence if there's nothing to be conscious of that intelligence? So in that same way, wherever there is Ishwara or Jiva, they're both pervaded and sustained by this one same reality consciousness, which is what chapter 13 is going to talk about. Okay, so section one was, was about revealing. Section two is about collapsing. So section one was not about a sadhana. It was just showing you that there is a no difference. Now we have to apply it to you, the individual. So section two is about collapsing. This is the sadhana part. So in other words, it collapses the apparent difference between you, the individual, and the cause of the universe called Ishwara. Now the question is, how is this done? We do this through a Mahavakya called Tattvamasi. Mahavakya in just simple English means equation. When two sides of an equation, like Tat and Twam, or the left and the right, are different, or seemingly different, and yet they're actually the same. What do we need to do? So I'm looking at side left and I'm looking at side right. In other words, I'm looking at the total Ishwara, like infinite, uh, limitless power, right? Infinite intelligence. And I'm looking at myself, the small, limited, time bound, apparently time bound, apparently more to individual. And there's a difference. But what does the Shruti say? The Shruti says there's the sameness between us. So what is my job? What is your job? We need to discover how is that so? So this means we need to find the commonality on the left side and we need to find the commonality on the right side. And by that, we then collapse the equation and then we understand, aha, so my individual nature is exactly the same as the total nature of the total Purusha. So is, question, is 10 equals one an equation? 10 equals one. Suppose I just tell you, Ishwara equals, you know, 10, big number, right? Ishwara equals the small individual, 10 equals one. Have I taught you anything? No, it just sounds good, right? It's like, oh, wow, you know, Ishwara and I are one, great. Uh, next, I'm gonna watch some, you know, comedy over there. Is five equals five an equation? Suppose I say Ishwara equals uh, you, is that an equation? Again, right? No, I'm just telling you, it is a fact, right? No doubt, but I'm not teaching you anything. I'm just telling you what's true. So there's a difference between telling you what's true and actually helping you understand how that is true for you right now, right here. So now what is an equation? 
here's an equation. 3 plus 2 equals 4 plus 1. That's an equation. 3 plus 2 on the left side, 4 plus 1 on the other side. Then they seem seemingly different, right? Like, you know, 3 plus 2, 3 and 2, and there's 4 and 1. Is the, the numbers are different, right? But if you add them up on both sides, you come to what? Five svarupa, five nature. And this is what we call collapsing the equation on the left side. That means the side of the total and on the side of the individual that is you and I. So in that same way, tat and tuam, we collapse their apparent differences between myself and the total. And then what happens? Upon the resolution, we find out that it is the same, just like the previous example was the nature was number five, what's going to be the nature here? Consciousness nature. Okay. And this process of adding up on both sides, that means resolving the differences, this process is called jnana yoga. So this is what, so what is jnana yoga for? Collapsing the difference between myself and the total. Okay. Finally, the third topic of chapter three, 13 to 18, I've done topic one, topic two, now topic three, is universal values or virtues. Suppose that you give a grade 10 maths equation to a grade three mind. Is the grade three mind going to understand that? Highly unlikely, why? Because the grade three mind hasn't gone through grade four, grade five, grade six, grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, and then finally grade 10. In other words, the grade three mind still is not qualified to understand the grade 10 equation. In other words, no matter how proficient the teaching or the teacher is, if the mind that's listening to the teaching is not qualified, it will simply not capture the depth or not take it personally. It will look at it as, is, as if I'm talking about some reality over there that applies to the rishis. But what are we talking about? We're talking about you, the listener, the one who's right here, right now. So this is the difference between a qualified mind or an unqualified mind. An unqualified mind is gonna say, this is so boring, I'm gonna go elsewhere, right? And they're gonna look, for, it's kind of start looking out for some, some uh, defects, right? In the teaching, in the teacher, in the environment, and it's gonna go elsewhere. And then sooner or later, it's gonna find a defect in that teacher also. And you just keep some hopping one place to the other. Whereas a qualified mind sits down at least for a few weeks and then goes, okay, what can I understand here? Let me at least try and then it moves on when it assesses whether it's getting it or not. Okay, so this means you need a qualified mind to understand the equation of tat tuam asi. So these are the three topics that we will be talking about between chapter 13 and 18. That is the context of the entire Bhagavad Gita. Now let's start with the verse. Can I ask one question? Yes, please. When we uh, talked about uh, karma yoga, we mentioned that when a child is born, the natural inclination is to look outside. The innate nature of uh, all of us is to look outward. Yeah. And then in, in spirituality, we always say, go inwards, look inwards, right? Mm -hmm. We also... Uh, we also learn that Ishra is everything, everywhere, available uh, all the time. Yeah. Then why we keep saying that, go inside? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lovely question. I, I knew it was going to head this way just when you said um, everything is Ishwara. However, for the person who doesn't know that everything is Ishwara, where is the mind going to be? It's going to be outside. In other words, everything is Ishwara for them except the person. That's why. So turning the person, turning the mind inwards also now acknowledges that Ishwar is also this very person who's been looking outwards. I think there's a nice story uh, of uh, 10 quote wise men cross the river. And when they crossed the river, there was only nine of them, right? And one of them goes, oh, there's only nine of us. Uh, someone's missing. And um, they're like, okay, well, let me count. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, no, we only got nine. We lost the person. And then they're all kind of like, you know, in distress. 
And then a wise man comes, of course, it's always a wise man, isn't it? On the horse and says, what seems to be the problem, boys? Oh, we lost the man, sir. Uh, we, you know, we had 10 people and we only got nine. And then the wise man counts. He goes, hmm, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then they figured out they forgot to include themselves. So this is the idea. Karma yoga makes also includes you. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Yes, please. We say that there's so much we can do uh, to attain moksha and there's no guarantee as such because of the limitations that we have in the free will that is given to us and because of a lot of unknown variables that were that we are not uh, aware of. And mm -hmm. only God's grace can make it possible for us. Mm -hmm. So these sentences you know, are a little uh, de discouraging to a seeker. And why should we be a seeker at the first place when our free will won't matter and we don't know, we are not in the total control? Then why should be a person should be seeker at the first place? And what should be the goal of a seeker if if someone you know yeah. gets into the spirituality and wants to attain moksha? Sure, sure. So we can say now the seeker is uh, like that you know that person who wants to go to sleep, right? So they're a seeker. So it's not like their efforts are being wasted, right? They're doing exactly what is meant for going to sleep. It's not like they're reading a book and jumping up and down. In fact, if they are jumping up and down and reading a book, they will probably stop doing that after some time because they will see, oh my God, I've been exhausted. I can't go to sleep. So it's going to force the person eventually to calm down. They have no choice. So in other words, because dharma is incorporated in every single individual, that dharma is always driving the person to do the right thing. And after some time, when they've exhausted their options of playing, you know, going left and right and chasing and seeking, they're going to start to narrow down their options. They're going to see through their own clarity of what hasn't worked. And they're going to, by that, start negating those non-working things and start doing more of those things that are working. So in that same way, does it matter for the seeker? Uh, not only Ishwara's grace, but it's also Ishwara's grace. That's the difference. So there is also your own effort, but there is also Ishwara's grace. These two are constant and interplay. Just like in order to go to sleep, you can't do it by yourself, but neither can Ishwara force you to do it by, by, by himself. That means both have to work together. So now you apply this to the seeker perspective. How do you now work together with Ishwara? You simply listen to Jnana Yoga. You listen to this knowledge, self-reflect, inquire, and therefore by the virtue of that, Time itself will help you to remove those, some inconsistencies, some inconsistent notions in the mind. Therefore, the knowledge will take place. So this means you are doing exactly what is meant to be done in order to have the full knowledge, the full clarity. In fact, if you think about it, we're always doing something to move towards the truth. You know, if you look at a kid, for example, um, they start out playing toys, right? And then they don't get attracted to that anymore, right? They just move on to something more mature and they get out of that also. And then it's a family, like a little bit more mature. And then, you know, you got Vana Prasta, right? Now, I can let me reflect onto my life now because everything I've done hasn't really worked. So I need to kind of reflect, that, am I really happy? So in other words, no matter how you look at it, which way you go, you are literally always being guided to the highest knowledge, to the, to the path of peace to the path of liberation. So in other words, you don't have to worry about making the wrong choice because your own, your own pursuit is going to naturally start to uh, take out those variables which are not working. Therefore, you're going to start uh, narrowing your vision towards those variables which are working. That's why we start our spiritual journey, you know, like burying ourselves in the ground and <laughs> at least where I live in Byron Bay, you know, there's so many spiritual things going on there. And, you know, playing didgeridoos in your ears and doing sound healing and chakra balancing and aura cleansing, right? And you do so many things, right? And then you, after some time you realize, okay, it, it sort of helped, but in retrospect, not really, because it was just causing me to try something else. So you start narrowing down those options and you come to this knowledge finally and you realize, okay, so this is, I need to know. It's about removing ignorance because the problem is ignorance. Therefore, the solution is knowledge. Arjuna uvacha prakritim purusham chaiva kshetram kshetradnyam evacha etadvedittum ichami 
Jnanam Jnayam Cha Keshava. Arjuna said, I wish to know this Keshava, Krishna, Prakriti and Purusha, the field and the knower of the field, the means of knowledge and what is to be known. And the question now is, what is Arjuna asking in this verse? He is asking about six technical words. And in the verse, he's going to ask about Prakriti, Purusha, Kshetram, Kshetradnya, Jnanam, and Nyayam. So this means we will learn about all of these words. And in order to understand them, we will first divide these words into three categories for the sake of understanding. Category one is Prakriti and Kshetram. These two words are near synonymous. There's slight differences between them, but for now, treat them as their synonyms. Okay. So the question is, what is Prakriti and Kshetram? That means category one referring to. It is referring to the entire material universe. Right now, you look left, you look right, up, down, here, Thoughts, emotions, memories, ideas, epiphanies, whatever you can imagine is category one. Material universe, subatomic particles, quarks, smallest of the smallest. It also includes energy like heat energy, that's also material by the way, gravitational force. For example, if you take the formula of Einstein, E equals mc squared, what is the basis of this formula? Energy converts into matter and vice versa. Where is it going to go if there's only one reality? Energy gets converted into matter and matter gets converted into energy. For example, you take water and you evaporate water. It converts into what? Vapor. It's not like it just disappeared out of nothing. So in other words, there's a conversion process whether we know about it or not. It is still there. Category one also includes thoughts, your thoughts right now. Suppose you want to ask me a question as Mina did. That is also category number one. Thoughts are also subtle matter. How is thoughts matter? It is matter. It's just subtle matter. For example, suppose I give you a, a, a medicine or um, some kind of a pill. Is your thoughts going to get affected by that? Suppose I give you some hallucinogenic substance. Definitely. Or I'll give you some medicine. In other words, giving you, what's medicine? Physical matter, gross matter. It affects directly what? Your thoughts. And what's thoughts? Subtle matter. In other words, mind is influenced by the biochemistry, by the hormones, by the medicine. Why? Because they're two, they're in the same order of reality. Just like that order of reality that I talked about, hardware and software. The software influences the hardware. The hardware influences the software. If the hardware, if the CPU is slow, then the software is going to perform poorly. If the software, you know, requires some CPU, um, uh, uh, GPU processing power, it's going to demand that power from the hardware. So they are constantly interrelated. They're talking to each other. And then you've got, for example, fMRI. You've got um, EEG, right? All of these uh, medical instruments to do what? To measure the gross activity. But what is that actually measuring? Also measuring the subtle activity. For example, if I hook up um, you know, instruments to your brain, I can see like theta, alpha, delta brain states, right? But what do those states represent? They represent your thoughts. They represent, that's why, for example, a, a meditator, they've done this with the uh, Buddhist meditators. They hook up the, uh, the, the, the EEG, I think it is, onto the brain. And they wanna see what is the brain undergoing when it is in a meditative state. And they can kind of see, you know, well, there's no prefrontal cortex activity. There's no activity in the back of the brain. So what does that represent? The thoughts are dormant. So this means if the thought, thoughts are dormant, therefore it has a direct reflection in the physical body. In this case, the brain. Category number one, that is Purusha and Kshetram, also includes anything that is manifest. For example, your hands right now is manifest. That pen is manifest right now but also unmanifest objects. That means they're not here yet. For example, where is your thought one minute from now? Do you know about the thought that's going to happen one minute from now? 
Of course, now that I've asked this question, it's going to influence the kind of thoughts you're going to have one minute from now. But either way, whatever those thoughts are, you just don't know. So we have to all wait now one minute, and then we will see what those thoughts are. Moments of peace. In other words, those thoughts are in a dormant state. They're in unmanifest mode. But it doesn't mean they don't exist. So therefore, both manifest and unmanifest is category number one. In chapter seven, this category number one is called apara prakriti. What is apara prakriti referring to? Triguna power, triguna shakti. The triguna shakti from which everything in this universe is made. Now you're going to say, why three? Why not four, right? What did I say about gunas? The shakti from which everything is made. So now let's ask the question. In order to make something, you need what? You need three specific principles. Number one, you need knowledge out of which that object will be. You need knowledge for that object. Let's put it that way. Knowledge out of which that object will be made. You need a blueprint for that object. Before you make a house, what's the first thing? You have people coming together. They sketch out the framework of the house. It takes a lot of planning. How deep will the foundation go? You look at the wind ratio, right? Is it in a windy place? The, the, the more the wind, the, you know, the thicker the brick. The colder it is, the thicker the brick. The more, the, the, the more I have to put the foundation deeper into the ground. Before I even start to put the, the concrete on, I have to put first the plumbing. In other words, so much planning goes into just the house. Now, that's just the house. I never mind the entire universe. So first thing, you need the knowledge of that object. Second, you need what for the house? You need the material. You need the bricks and the you know, plumbing material, electricity and the cables and all that. So you need the material. So if knowledge is sattvaha, material is tamaha. Now, if I just have material there and I have architects and they don't do anything with that material, do you have a house? No. So this means you need rajaha. You need the power which assembles the material from the blueprint that is from the knowledge. Therefore, rajaha puts together the sattva guna and the tamaguna to create this material universe. Now, what do we say about Ishwara, about God? What is God? Nimitta karanam upadana karanam, the material cause and the intelligent cause. What is intelligent cause? Sattva guna. What is material cause? Tamaguna. But so what? You still need power. And that's why we say Ishwara is Sarva Jnanam Sarvam Shakti. All knowledge, all power. What is that power? Rajaguna. That power which puts together that entire blueprint of the entire universe, including your hands right now, your eyes that are capable of seeing this message, your ears that are capable of understanding and picking up the sound vibrations entering into the ear, into those delicate cells that are causing vibrations entering the brain, being interpreted by the physical brain, being sent into the mind. All of this intelligence is what? By the help of the material that is the physical brain, but also being put together and sustained together by a Rajaguna. Therefore, Sattva Guna, Rajaguna, and Tamaguna are working together to create this universe, to modify this universe, and to also sustain this universe all the time. So lastly, what is category one? Summary, anything that can be perceived an object of experience, an object of perception. What am I talking about? Everything. When are you not perceiving? When is perception or experience not happening? Never. Even if you say nothing's happening, that is still an experience of nothing. So even that is category number one. Okay, category one done, category two. These are the words that include purushaha, kshetra dnya, and dnyayam. These are synonyms, however, there are fine distinctions. They are all referring to these words that I mentioned, to the final reality, consciousness, called Brahman. In chapter 7, we call this para prakriti, the one reality without a second. When I say without a second, what does this mean? It means there's only one, there's no second reality out there. Whatever second reality is out there is in the mind. It's like imagining, but it's imagining what? It's imagining in this total reality. So one without a second is Advaitam. Knowing category one, which is material, and category two, which is the final reality, consciousness, knowing that, we can now ask, what constitutes the cause of the universe? 
I'm talking about everything. Tomorrow, today, yesterday, everything. What constitutes the cause of the universe? Is it just category number one? No. Why, is it, why can it not be just category number one? Because it's just material, right? But what is there to be... If, if you just have an intelligent person in a coma, that's intelligent person that's capable of creating a house and they're in a coma, they're not conscious, is that person useful? <laughs> no. So this means the person has to be useful in order to make use of his power, his knowledge, and the material to create anything. In that same way, what is the cause of the universe? A mixture of category number one, that is material, and category number two, that is consciousness. It means not one or second, both. So therefore, what's the cause of the universe? It is a two-fold nature. So this cause we can call a, a two-fold cause. This is why in the Indian symbology we have Vishnu and uh, Lakshmi. Or we have a, a Shiva and Parvati. You've seen that, right? There's always like, why is there always a man and a woman? What does this mean? Is this just like symbology? Yes, it is symbology. Reality one, reality two. Category one, category two. Material consciousness. Just to give you a metaphor to understand this better, take it from the standpoint of your own dreams. The cause of the dream, your dream, is twofold. So when you dream tonight, right, it's going to be a twofold cause. What are those twofold causes? There's going to be a conscious person. That's why you wake up, right? You say, oh, you know, I had a dream. What does that imply? A conscious person was there in the dream. That same conscious person is here now in the waking state. So conscious person and also what also constitutes the dream? Your mind. Is your, is your dream not only just a, a collection of all the th things that you know from your life? Absolutely. Therefore, what constitutes the, your dream? It is a twofold cause. Conscious person, which is called Purusha, and the mind, in this case, called Prakriti. Now, when this twofold cause swallows the entire dream universe, then what remains? It's called Brahman. When this twofold cause manifests the total universe of names and forms, then from the standpoint of that world, which you, the jiva, find yourself in, we call that twofold cause Ishwara. When the twofold cause manifests as an individual, the one that's listening to this right now, by the way, then that same twofold cause is called Jiva. So in all three examples, what are we talking about? The same two-fold cause. Purusha, the conscious being, and the material. So now the question is, who am I? If you ask yourself from the standpoint of your, from you, who am I? This very two-fold cause. Because everything is this two-fold cause. There's nothing other than the two-fold cause. In fact, everything is a twofold cause. So there's nothing special about knowing who you are <laughs> because everything is already what it is, what it's always been, and it will never be anything other than what it is. Just the twofold cause. Now, this cause, Ishwara, that is, when you look at it from, it can be looked at from three standpoints. You can look at it from a standpoint of manifestation, then we call it Brahma. We can look at it from a standpoint of sustenance, then we can call it Vishnu. We can look at it from the standpoint of change, and that's called Shiva. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. We just assign these, don't get mixed up with these names. We just give these Sanskrit names because the scriptures are in Sanskrit, right? So you need to give this like these poetical, beautiful descriptions and you're just, instead of just saying kind of these boring manifest, unmanifest, and, you know, sustenance. So you give these nice, beautiful names. That's all it is. Category number three is jnanam. The word jnanam has two meanings. The first one is paroksha jnanam. Before explaining this, look at some object, please, right now. Lay your eyes on some object. While you're looking at that object, I'm going to say this. 
the knowledge, please keep looking at an object right now, the knowledge arising in the mind from that object being cognized right now, that knowledge is called paroksha jnanam. So your mind right now on the screen of the mind is showing that image. Whatever that image is, it's being cognized by what? By the mind instruments, which I will talk about what the mind is in specific detail. That is called paroksha jnanam. Now, whether it is an external, you can stop looking by the way, whether it's external object or an internal object like an emotion or a memory, it is still paroksha jnanam. What is paroksha jnanam? Anything that can be cognized by the mind. Uh, is it like uh, observation? Anything that can be observed, anything that can be objectified, anything that can be experienced. That object that you were looking at was an experience. What kind of experience? It was an experience of that object in the form of that shape, in the form of that color, in the form of that, if it was a sound, so be it. Paroksha jnanam. The second definition is aparoksha jnanam. This is direct knowledge of the subject behind the screen of the mind. So I just explained paroksha jnanam, right? Whatever was being cognized was being presented on the screen of your mind. Because whatever sense data is coming to this, into this mind, it's in, in the mind, it's being processed by the brain. So what is aparoksha jnanam? It is knowledge of the subject in whose presence all paroksha jnanam is constantly validated, constantly presented, in whose presence it is known. What is aparoksha jnanam? The knowledge of the subject the knowledge of I am. So there is only one Aparoksha Jnanam in this entire universe, and that is you, the subject. And there is infinite Paroksha Jnanams, knowledge of uh, language, knowledge of food, knowledge of how to cook, knowledge of how to drive, all of this is Paroksha Jnanam. But only one Aparoksha Jnanam, and that is knowledge of I. So this means Aparoksha Jnanam is direct knowledge of oneself arising once the false notions of who I am have been removed. By what? I said earlier on, by Jnana Yoga. When you see the equation on the left side and you see the equation on the right side, you see they're one and the same. That recognition is called Aparoksha Jnanam, which we call Moksha. I'll give you a little metaphor to make it more relatable. Suppose right now you and I go on a desert. It's a hot day, right? and we see a water oasis, and we're all thirsty, we need water badly. And we see this lovely image of a water oasis. It's on there. It's a mirage, right? Over the desert. Now to the perceiver, that mirage looks real, does it not? Absolutely. Now suppose the perceiver doesn't understand what this mirage phenom phenomena is. What is the perceiver gonna do? they're going to have a corresponding emotion and a corresponding thought as though that mirage is real. So you're going to run over, they're going to get excited, they're going to find joy, right? They're going to waste a lot of energy running for nothing. So they're going to have an experience consistent with their own ignorance of that mirage. So it's going to elicit an equal emotion, an equal thought according to what I see. Why? Because what I'm looking at, I see as real but I do not understand that it is a dependent reality. I do not understand that it's a phenomena created, why? Because there's a hot ground and then it warms the air and then when the light hits the cold air, by the time it enters the warm air, which is above the ground, it goes through a process of bending, a refraction, and therefore it causes the phenomena of called the mirage. I do not understand that. Therefore, I take it as real. So now what do we need to do? We need to give this perceiver the one who's taking it as real, we need to give them a pramana, a means of knowledge. And what is this going to do? It's going to remove or it's going to show them why that is so. What is the nature of that mirage? And what is the substratum which that mirage actually requires for that mirage to be seemingly real? So we need to give them this means of knowledge. And once we tell them called jnana yoga, which is what's been expounded in chapter 13, then is the mirage going to disappear? No. What's going to change? The person's relationship to the mirage. Why is this important? Because we often think that an enlightened person somehow sees something else, right? They're like in a different universe. 
there is no difference whatsoever. The only difference is there's a different relationship with the world because the world is still operated through the laws and orders called Yavaharika transactional reality. It's not going to go away. Whether I know that this world is false, even if I do know it, it's still going to remain. So this means even if, even if I gain the pramana and I remove the false notions, the world remains exactly the same, but what changes? The relationship to the world. In other words, now the thoughts and emotions don't go out, don't externalize themselves unnecessarily. Why? Because I'm no longer chasing what, what inherently doesn't have much joy in the first place. So this means there's a certain maturity in the perceiver now. They're still in that same place, right? Observing the mirage, you can still enjoy it. They can still go over there and you know, kind of interface with it if they want, but they don't get lost in it because they know what's the truth of it. Okay, and finally, in chapter 13, I'm still on category number three. This jnanam refers to 20 values or virtues which qualify the mind for aparoksha jnanam. So suppose that a father says to his son, hey son, what you see over there, that mirage, it is not real. Now suppose, you know those teenagers, like they're 13 and 14, they're like, know everything, not all of them, but you know, they're kind of in this world of know it all. Even if you tell, even if you sincerely want to help and you know, the person's still not going to listen. So this means the, the, these 20 values that we will go through in detail will help us to understand the nature of reality much better than we could otherwise. So someone asked me about, I want to learn about Hindu Dharma. This will be specifically these Dharmic principles of the Hindu Dharma. Like what is Dharma? How to live Dharma in our everyday life? Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Idam Shariram Kaunteya Kshetram Ityabhidhiyate Etadyo Vetitam Prahuhu Kshetradnya Ititadvidaha uh, Kaunteya Arjuna, this body is called field. The one who knows this field is the knower of the field. Thus say those who know that. So the basis of this verse is what is the distinction between kshetram and kshetradnya? Question, why are we going to do this inquiry? Because this is called neti neti, a method of negation. In other words, by understanding who I am not, I understand who I am. I understand the final reality. Only once I first understand what is the nature of this mind and this body. So let's focus on kshetram. Kshetram refers to the body that you're experiencing right now intimately. A little homework, please pinch yourself just to make sure that you understand what this body is. Pinch, pinch. So to know this body, the one that experienced this pinch, we need to understand two meanings of the word kshetram. So kshetram has two meanings. Meaning one, we need to take that root, kshi. So what does the root kshi mean? It means that which wanes. So whatever you pinched right now, that which wanes, disintegrates, perishes, decreases, Yes, you can keep looking at your body now and go, hmm, this is decreasing, waning, perishing, lessening, weakening by the day. In other words, in short, that which undergoes constant modification. To mo in one minute, you're going to lose about 900 million cells. That's the last time I checked uh, on Google. I think three minutes or one minute. Either way, you're going to lose cells. <laughs> we don't need to know the number. <laughs> So now the question is, what specifically modifies about the body, this body that you pinched? We're going to use the five kosha model. So why am I now telling you this? To understand your body, because we say, oh, I'm the, you know, I know what this body is, I've been carrying around all my life. Well, let's really see how well we understand it. So let's take the five kosha model. The first layer of this individual that is both comprising the body and the mind is the food layer. You put food layer. Food layer is called the Anamaya Kosha. It means the physical body. The Anamaya Kosha is that which is made entirely of food. It consists of muscles, tissues, bones, organs, 
cells, blood, etc. That's it. Look at your body right now. All is just food. Nothing but the, all of the food that you've been eating since the beginning of birth. And then we kind of go, oh, you know, that's a hot looking body. You might as well just say that's food in a form of a body that looks hot. So, so if you start to understand these models, you start to see the world in a different way. It's no longer the superficial, oh, I see this body and it's so beautiful and it's the object worth dying for, etc. You really start to get objectivity towards everything. So this body, this Anamaya Kosha, this physical body is endowed with, number one, five organs of perception. And they are used for perceiving the world. If you close your eyes, you won't be able to perceive sight. You will still perceive sound and taste and smell and tactile feedback, but there will be, no, there will be a world minus sight. So this body is endowed with five organs of perception. Used for what? Perceiving the world. And all of the data that you get through the world is through your sight, through, through the sight, sound, smell, touch, and, um, and taste. So all of these five senses make up what we call the jagat, the world. The second endowment is five instruments of transaction. And they are used for the sake of engaging with the perceived world. If I just give you eyes and you cannot walk over to, to that object which you find so beautiful, what kind of creation is that? You just be kind of, you know, laying there, completely paralyzed, unable to move. So in other words, if I perceive a car coming towards me, I need to then what? Engage a certain organ in order to move out of the harm's way. What are these five organs of transaction? They are speech. All our life, we use speech to get things, to communicate things, to go from A to B, to, to marry, to enjoy, to, to, you know, talk. Speech, number one. Number two is hands. Right now, using hands to write or using hands to, you know, crossing your hands, etc. So using hands to hold objects. Sex organ. Without a sex organ, you and I will not be here. Who would be to reproduce? Nobody. Feet. They're used to move your position A to position B so you can get things done. Anus. That represents the excretion mechanism that this body does because this body consumes food it then has to excrete the excess toxins. Therefore, these five organs of transactions sustains this body. Now, what happens when you use your hands, for example? For example, you use to write, and then you put your hands down, and then you no longer need your, your hands. Or you speak. Right now, you're not speaking, but suppose you, you want to speak. What happens then? You speak, and you gain an answer. Or you walk. You walk for a glass of water. And then what do you do? You sustain your body. In other words, every organ of transaction is used to sustain life, is used for a purpose. Right now, are, you, are your feet working? Not, not really. In other words, right now, even though you have those five organs of action, most of them are inactive. When you need to get up, then what's going to work? Your feet, your feet are going to work, and then maybe the, you know, the anus is going to work for excretion, and then you come back, and then those five organs of action are back into their dormant state. So like this, all our life, organs of action, dormant, dormant organs of action, active. Okay, the second layer is the energy layer. This is the pranamaya kosha. How to understand prana? That's a question. Think of prana, think of a fan right now, a fan that's spinning. The fan can be equated to the Anamaya Kosha. What's the Anamaya Kosha? The physical body, the physical instrument. But what is the unseen electricity that powers that fan? That can be equated to the prana. I'm not now equating electricity to consciousness like I did in the previous example. In this case, the invisible energy that powers that instrument is called prana. How do you experience this layer? And when do you experience this layer? You experience it when you feel energized, sleepy, sexually passionate, hungry, thirsty. This prana has five functions. The first is prana. So prana has five functions. Out of these, number one is called prana. What does prana do? It's used for sustaining and maintaining your inhalation and exhalation. That's why even if a person is brain dead, are they still breathing? Yes. 
even if the brain is not working, what's the working? Breathing. In other words, pra breathing does not rely on the brain. It relies on what? It relies on the prana. That's why the person can be brain dead and still there's an aspect of them, the, bo the body is still functioning and that's called prana. So prana used for automating the breathing and the, the exhalation and the inhalation. The second one is apana. Apana. This is for expulsion. This evacuates the waste from the body, toxins like sweat, urine, stool. Without apana, couldn't eliminate any toxins. The person would die very quickly. Even right now, the skin is shedding. Right? If, when you go to the bathroom, what's going to get activated? The apana prana. The next one is samana. This is digestion. This is responsible for digesting the food and distributing, thus nourishing the entire body. The next one is vyana. This is used for circulation of the blood throughout the nervous system. Arteries, moving blood, like literally movement of and, and activating that movement. For example, by the week five or six, the embryo, you will see the heart even before the brain is developed. What happens? The heart, one moment, completely still. This is five or six weeks of pregnancy. The next moment, what happens to the heart? It starts beating by itself. What does this mean? It doesn't need the brain. This is prana, specifically vyana activated. It starts to circulate the blood throughout this small embryo. The last one is udana. This is used for vomiting and burping. Whenever you burp or even hiccups, what's activated? Udana, guaranteed. This is also the last prana, the last function that leaves that is active before the person dies. So when a person dies, what happens? The subtle body, that means includes the mind, that is the transmigrating agent, the one that inherits a new body, that one gets expelled. In other words, the mind gets expelled from the Anamaya Kosha. What does that? the udana. So that is the very last prana that is active right before the person leaves. Uh, books, they call it, you know, the soul leaving the body. What made it leave the body? Udana. Next week, we will continue looking into kshetram, looking into this body, looking into these five layers, and then we will also look into kshetradnya. One quick question, Andre. Yes. Um, uh, this five koshas are only for uh, humans or uh... What about animals and plants? If you can. Uh, for plants, it's not going to be a five kosha model. For an animal um, uh, body, yes. Um, prana, yes. Mind, intellect, yes. Yeah, for an animal also. So for plants, we have only one kosha. Can you say that? I would just say anamaya kosha. I would say pranamaya kosha. And I would say a, a, a level of manomaya kosha. In other words, it doesn't have the capacity to make decisions of its own. So it's obviously not going to have the Vijnana Maya Kosha, the intellect, but it's still going to respond like to photosynthesis to uh, even the Venus flytrap, right? It's going to react to the environment of the fly and that's, it closes. So there's a certain intelligence there. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sante Bhaktrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschituhkabhag Bhavet Om Shanti Shanti Shanti